Hey, you all. Hey, Phil. How y'all doing? I'm doing fantastic. <laughs> totally, totally what fantastic. Are we doing here? <laughs> I don't know. What are we doing here? <laughs> We're trying to fix an embarrassing lapse in our abilities. I don't find it embarrassing. Oh, you don't find it embarrassing? No, and I'll tell you why. Three years ago, when we sat down to record our very first podcast ever, we didn't know what we were doing. I didn't know how to edit. We didn't know how to do this at all. So, yeah, it could have been improved upon, but I think that we are benefiting from three years of experience coming back to this episode to re-edit it, to cut out the garbage. I'm not embarrassed at all, except obviously I'm, you know, getting rid of it. <laughs> that was our first dry run, and we were just figuring out how I to... think they figured it out. Oh, fine. my goodness. <laughs> it was, it that... was pretty, <laughs> it's pretty obvious, I think, yeah. So, uh, do you want us to reintroduce ourselves? I like the idea of... How did Erickson put it? I think he said less is more. Mm -hmm. He's from that school of literature where they try to reveal things through actions and not words. And I think that it's patently obvious that we're fans of science fiction and fantasy mm. by what we're doing. The fact that we've been doing this for three years, I think, is kind of awesome. I'm impressed that we've been able to stick with it. It's been eight seasons. Get it out. Yeah, we've done eight amazing. books since The Black Company. We've done eight other books. You haven't been on three of them. Thankfully, it sounds like two, at least for one of them. Dude, Leviathan Wakes was a blast to destroy. Well, anyway, we have re-edited this episode from the original audio because the tracks are essentially lost. The individual tracks, I don't even have them. It wasn't Buzzsprout. It was it was the other medium that we I were think using we were at the time. we it, wasn't it? I think so, too. And the audio is garbage. Yep. There is zero I can do about that because I don't have the original files anymore. I don't think I ever kept them. I think I edited the episode and deleted them like a ding dong. Again, something that three years of experience will teach you not to do. But we fortunately still had the original episode. I trimmed it down. This is the result. And yeah, if you want me to do the subsequent episodes of The Black Company and release them one a month for the next five or six months, let me know in the comments or email us or whatever. Well, certainly enjoy our refined, polished, improved version of chapter one. 22 minutes better. <laughs> I don't even right. know if this is better all of a sudden. <laughs> I know. It's, it's like it's our first time. <laughs> it's, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Enjoy. What is the Black Company? The Black Company is a mercenary company. You know, they're hired out to the syndic of this town called Beryl. They've been around for like a long time, like a long time. They have historians that travel with them. And the Black Company that we're following the story is from that point of view, the historian. Okay. Do you have anything to add to that? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, yeah, they're a mercenary group. They have a long and storied past. They're organized as a military structure with a captain, a lieutenant, quartermaster, platoon leaders, several wizards, and a historian that they refer to as an analyst. And that person is Croker in these novels. And he is the protagonist of these novels. Their number is not really revealed. The total number of people in the Black Company, we don't really know. We just know that it has to be in the hundreds. And they're working as a private police force for the Syndic, as you all mentioned. And that's where the novel begins in Beryl, Queen of the Jeweled Cities. All right, so chapter one is called The Legate. If you had to look it up like I did, the definition can be a representative such as an ambassador, envoy, or delegate. And that is the most pertinent definition that was available for the chapter. And you'll see what we're talking about shortly. Well, I think that's a Roman word. It's a Roman title. It originally. is, but it doesn't, obviously, these could, people could aren't mean Roman. a lot of things. Well, no, I mean, a legate is a legate but we're talking about a generic legate. All right, so we know where they are. We know what they're doing. Oh, and they've been there for several years, at least. And we know it's summertime, and it is hot. Should we get started, guys? Yes. yes. Move forward. All right, let's, let's do this. All right, so the book opens up with a poisoning. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's be, let's, let's, okay, we need well, to do setting a little bit better. They're in the city. We already did all that. No, no, we didn't. They're in barrel. Yes. It's hot. It's summertime. Yes, yes, yes. But what we didn't talk about uh, is the, the... book literally starts with poison. Well, there is the preamble. <laughs> but why does somebody get poisoned? You have to preamble that. 
And the reason they got poisoned is because there's a conflict between the black company and what they call the, the, blues. the blues, the urban cohorts. And the black company is a police force where I guess the, the urban cohorts are an actual military. I, I'm not sure. The black company's purpose in Barrel is they are the personal military protective agency for the syndic who is like the governor of the city, the governor mm -hmm. of the city state. They are a private bodyguard for the Secret Senate. service. Yes, they're in his express <laughs> service because the military of the city is unreliable. Yeah, but the urban cohorts don't want them there. Well, of course not. That's a ton of people for a secret service. I would like my own private army. <laughs> um, you said there was hundreds, right? There have to be. They didn't, they didn't specify, but I get the impression there's hundreds, yes. Right. <laughs> yes, there has to be. Well, not thousands. Just hundreds. We'll get to the reasoning for that at the very end of this little section, but uh, <clears throat> many, many of the black company still exist. Mm -hmm. So yes, the opening of the book is one of their crew gets poisoned. Curly. Curly. Curly has a tummy ache. That's right. No, Yule is correct. There were two. That's right. Well, there's two dead. Well, they don't know until they cut open the first two that died. Yeah. They realize there's some poisoning going on. Yeah. Well, you're right. Curly comes in. Yes. So Croker does this highly sophisticated triangulation theory to find out exactly where these people were, what they ate, who they socialized with, and how 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 they died, and who who killed them, and where they got poisoned. Does that sum it up? Yeah. Yeah. Two of them died, and then uh, Croker came up with a antidote, as it were, saved the third poisoner, poison victim. And by the fourth one, was able to not only save him, but determine the source of the poison. That's right. So there's, there's the poisoning. So immediately following the poisoning, Croker wants to go and report his findings to their captain, who is unnamed throughout the first chapter at least. And on his way to see the captain, we get a lot of scene setting for the city mm -hmm. of Beryl. There's a discussion about the bay the lighthouse in the distance, there's the mole, which he's not real clear about what that is, the city wall, how ancient the city is. He, re he refers mm -hmm. to it many <clears throat> times that the city is absolutely ancient. Well, he does do some foreshadowing when he talks about how like lightning out of the blue uh, destroyed or at least half shattered some magical wards on this ancient crypt. I'm not sure if he was foreshadowing or backshadowing because he was he, he did mention that, oh, it's easy to read the, read the signs after the fact. Wise gift for uh, <laughs> hindsight. So what I really like about this is it starts off, it seems like it's starting off in a past tense situation. And then we're going back even far, or, and then we're, you know, then we're going back to what led up to this. Is this a version of uh, three weeks earlier, or is it okay because it's the narrator telling us this? Do you have a problem with it? I do anytime three weeks earlier occurs. Does he ever do it though? No, 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 no. And that's just you being very rigid in the way that you like or dislike a book. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just interested in the way he's telling this. Like from the very beginning, he's like, this portends of things to come. He hints. And then we're finding out what that's, and maybe it's just happening as it's happening. Do you agree that it was stylish, stylishly done? Did it take you out of the story? No, not at all. Not at all. It just leaves uh, the gently. third time, fifth time reading it. Oh, yeah, it's my third time, too. And yes, the book actually doesn't start with a poisoning. It starts with two pages of this kind of hindsight preamble where, as Philip says, he enumerates all of the things that could be viewed as portents, and they just disregarded them or ignored them or didn't notice them. But in hindsight, he realizes it was the beginning. But it's only later that you understand the significance of a lot of the stuff, which is why I choose to ignore it in the beginning. This is why I started with the poisoning as opposed to the actual lightning strike. All right, so there's the scene setting and stuff. And while Croker is walking his way to go see the captain to tell him the horrible news that they're going to have to go and bust some heads, a ship arrives in the harbor. And it's not just any ship. It's a black ship. And it is massive. I believe it has five rows of oarsmen. Yeah. It has a huge black sail. And on it is an animated, magically animated skull with fire behind its teeth and eyes with a silver circlet around mm. its skull. 
around the head of the skull. That ship just rolls right into the harbor when he's on his way to go see the captain. Not going to play a part in this. All right, so the next thing is the, as I refer to it, is the dust up at Mole Tavern. So the yeah. captain decides that they're going to go and they're going to see to these poisoners. Yeah, but they only, they only take like a dozen men. Is that right? It was a dozen plus a dozen men. It's Mercy one. and Silent and like 10 other people or something. They had three at the back door, two at each of the side windows. I know they only went in with three people. Pretty, it was pretty minimal. Well, I had to be four. Oh, five. It doesn't really matter. It wasn't many. No. Yule, would you like to explain what happened? So it's Croker, our narrator, and it's Mercy, who is described as a, a real jerk of a person, a Not person a nice that man. never stopped taking the wings off of flies. Yes. And so he's a real, and he really gets off on it too, and he's kind of short, so it's like a little Napoleon complex or something. And then Silent doesn't say anything, and before they go to this place, Silent takes like half a day to go into the forest. And when he comes back, he comes out with a big sack. And so they go on into this tavern, mole tavern. And then they're like, Varys, get your butt out here. And like, that's how, kind of how the dialogue is in this book. Again, you know, one of the things I really like about it is just it, it reads like a book you'd want to read no matter what. Uh, so they go in and they uh, get this like grandfather out. And he's like, get your sons out here too. And he's like, why? And they're like, well, because of murder. Two, two uh, poisoning and two attempted murders by poisoning. And everybody in the bar, like this one guy takes a sword out and he jams it in the table. And everybody's like getting really crazy because they're like, oh, if something's going down, it doesn't matter if we're involved or not, we're going to go along with, you know, get taken down. Oh, and I, I should have said, they came, at, our guys came in with swords and shields out already. So basically, one, some guy gets a drop on one of our nobody characters, our red shirts, and everything is going like tits up, and Mercy's like, hey, Silent, get this thing going, you know? And so Silent does something, we don't know what, and I, that's a cool thing because Croker is our narrator, so he didn't see what. And at first I was like, oh, is this guy a magic guy? He doesn't talk, but he still casts spells and everything. But what you find out is he took uh, like a hornet's nest, basically. And these things are big. And I forget what they're called, like bald. Bald-faced bald hornets, faced. I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so all of the tavern's red shirts, they're out. And then our guys take control. And I think Mercy gets messed up in that. He gets like the finger. No, that's he not He just yet. got a nick. It was some, the red oh, shirt yeah. got messed up, but nobody died. Oh yeah, that was a funny part. So I was like, <laughs> there's a scene in this one where the first guy, first guy of the black company goes down because he just got kind of shiv. And Croker steps up and Mercy looks at him and says something like, oh, I can't believe, oh, you're going to come up and do this? What do you think you're doing? You know? And Croker's like, yeah, I'm going to write you out. You're not going to be in the history at all. And he's all, you don't ever skip out, <laughs> skip out on information. And yeah, that's cool stuff. I like that. So that's what happens at Mole Tavern. Essentially, they subdued everybody. And then one of the wizards did take a little peek around. And they found that there was a secret room underneath the tavern. Mm -hmm. And it had a large number of conspiring blues in the middle of a meeting. And they all got captured. Bloodless. Mostly bloodless. Mostly bloodless. But they said the line stretched across the block. Like it was a block long line of prisoners that they start marching up. Marching up to go see the syndic, who is a red, by the way. So 12 guys, or something like that number, yep. captured over 100 of their antagonists. And it was like it was nothing. Uh -huh. Well, they, they did have the help of the hornets. Well, and a wizard. <laughs> and a wizard, definitely <laughs> a wizard. It's nice to have a wizard. Okay, so um, they march these guys, all hundred of them or whatever, up to go see the syndic, and it is along that route that we see this figure, all in black, clad in black, face mask black. It's a morion, is what it's called. Gloves black, black horse, black, you know, everything. Big black horse. Very imposing person, even though I think they were described as live. Effeminate, um, even. Although, Croker does refer to that person as a he in that same sentence. So, yeah. you take what you will of that. 
Well, I, I think it's a little important to emphasize that the first time they see this black writer, these battle-hardened, brave, tough men are shaken. They're cowed by that, that it, person. Actually, this, this, this black writer like radiates like fear. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, they're, they're all affected by it, except, except for Silent. Silent just stared him right in the eyes, and, the, and what black writer just like stared at him back, and they locked eyes, and Silent wouldn't back down. Didn't back down, but Croker described him as diminished. Mm. Yes, 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 yes. Diminished. They allow this rider to have the right of way. And they watch as he, he goes by with his entourage. But they assess the strength of this entourage as being slightly less than the black company. Slightly. Nevertheless, they follow on their way up to go see the syndic. This capture, because they were the most conservative of the blues that were captured, the more antagonistic, the more anarchistic of the blues end up rioting. Yes. Violence in the street. Essentially thousands of angry people without a leader. Trying to stem the tide of chaos before they retreated into the keep, the black company lost over 100 men and they could never afford to lose one. But I seem to recall that there's more than just rioting in the streets. They start to hear screaming, and it's like, that's not the screams of somebody being torn apart or murdered. That's, that's the screams of a beast of some kind, a creature, for Yeah. What is a for Velaka? It's referred to initially as a vampire, something that drinks blood, eats the livers and hearts of men, is humanoid but not human. But I think it's one eye clarifies that a four of is not really a vampire. It's a were leopard. They're basically indestructible. They're basically immortal. And the only way to deal with them is to bury them alive, which is just what the city of Beryl did to 49 of these things in ancient times. I have no idea how they could possibly capture 49 of these incredibly indomitable creatures. They were no. gullible. <laughs> and if you go in there, <laughs> no way. I mean, it's super powerful magic. There's no other way to explain it. Mm-hmm. it so, so it they be. did. They put they put all these. They put 49 Forvalaka in this tomb, and then they sealed it with magic. And that's when we get to the lightning bolt that came out of the blue that blasted half of the magical wards off of that tomb during the rioting, which we're talking about right now. Some ding dong got the bright idea to go and raid that tomb. Humans break into the tomb, busting through the rest of whatever was protecting the city from the one remaining Forvalaka. Yes. The smartest, the most cunning, the most vicious Mm -hmm. female Forvalaka that killed all of her kin to survive. And ate them. Is the fact that she is, or that the four Velaka is female, is that also part of the thing? I mean, is that's questionable, man. I just don't know. I'm not sure if it's important, but no, I'm not either. I mean, something that took care of the other 49, it wouldn't have mattered if it was male or the fact that it was female well, made it. Well, well okay. it's, it's wow. a detail that's mentioned by the author, uh-huh. but whether it's significant or not, I honestly don't remember. But a lot of the book is kind of a mystery until you get to subsequent chapters anyway. So it may become more relevant, but I don't remember it being relevant. Mm. She looks like a 30-year-old woman. Yeah. The four Velaka is just preying upon the city at random. I don't remember how long this period lasts, but I was under the impression it lasted for several weeks, a few weeks. Long enough for the chaos to die down out of sheer terror. Yeah. (laughs) People started shutting themselves in. Not that it helped, but it kept them off the streets. And one other thing they did talk about, you, they started getting plague associated with four Velaka attacks. They didn't elaborate, but um, it's implied that there's a correlation, but there's not a consistent correlation. Yeah, there would be like a ring of plague surrounding areas where the four Velaka had killed somebody. Mm-hmm. But I think Croker dismisses the possibility that the four Velaka is the actual vic- or, uh, vector mm-hmm. because... Oh, because they, they'd been into the tomb where the four Velaka was, and none of them got sick. Oh, that's right. Yeah, because black, several black company people went in the tomb, and nobody got sick. That's right. right. So there's, there's a suspicion right there. That there's something else going on. Something else is going on, exactly. Like, it's not going quite as fast as somebody may have wanted it, so they're adding to the, to the mess. Mm. Don't know. It's hard to say. 
Okay, so the black company knows that there's a four Velocca loose. They thought it was a myth. They thought it was a, you know, a tale to keep people in the city in line. So they decide to go up to the tomb. And that's when they see the bones and they, oh boy, there were 49 of them. And there's only the bones of thir- you know, 48. One of them's on the loose. They confirm it. And then they decide to get the hell out of there. Yeah, they had two wizards there that are quite powerful in their own right. And they tell the story about from their two brothers, two brother wizards. And they tell the story about their master, who's more powerful than them, could not handle one for Velaka. That's yeah. one eye and Tom Tom. Over 100 years old, according to the records of the historians in the Black Company. They basically have seen enough. The Black Company knows between the enemies that they have in the military, the numbers of people that they've just lost, the fact that this legate is out in the, oh, we never talked about why the legate was there. And they know at this point. They don't know yet, do they? I think they do. Have we gotten back well, to where we find out? <sighs> well, we'll get there real quick then. Yeah. I think that's what's coming next right now. There are a lot of things, basically, that have built up so far in the chapter that the black companies become aware of, and they're like, we have got to get out of here. Our commission the final is- final nail is what the legate has offered them. That hasn't happened yet. That hasn't happened oh, that's yet. that's just about to happen is what you're saying. Well, yeah. The preamble for meeting with the legate is that they have a discussion about their, res- op- resign- their options, resigning their commission because it's stay and die honorably or leave um, and break their contract, which kind of undermines their reputation. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the syndic is pressuring them this whole time to like <laughs> – quell the rioting in the streets and they are pointing out the fact that they're not a police force they're a private bodyguards essentially for him and they don't want to die here they don't want to be martyred so they they do have this discussion and it's a moral question or ethical question um, but it's also about their their reputation croker uh who's their historian said no we cannot give up our commission it's a bad idea the one time we did it in the past it was our darkest time ever, and it hung with them for a long time. It took them who knows how long to build up their reputation again. But <laughs> <laughs> they're in their darkest time right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It seems like, it. So it's 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 this is this is a very important part. How they're more than willing to let their morality slip and find a convenient loophole to get them out of their commission. Then well, that's what Croker says. If you can find one. Then I'll go along I'll support he, it. He's kind of like the linchpin that's going to like make sure it happens. Like well, he's going to cherry top it too, you know. Like he's he yeah. writes the history. Yeah, that's exactly. right. So the captain, they don't explain how they get this idea, but they go and see the legate on their ship. And they row out there and they marvel at this ship. And I think the lieutenant used to be a ship boy or something like that. And he said it's it's not possible the ship would break apart. It's it's no way it can stick together, and that's when who one eye or I think it or was Tom Tom. I think it was Tom Tom said that yeah, with with a sufficient amount of magical power, you can hold this amazing vessel together. And obviously they they are. Yeah, I guess yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it gives you an idea also who you're dealing with. Who you're dealing with? Somebody on that ship is powerful, 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 and like powerful enough to make the wizards of the Black Company kind of quake a little bit. Uh, but they do make a deal. They come back with an offer, if I remember correctly, and then the captain sends them back with another one. And not only that, during this whole time, he was trying to like give up being the captain. Yeah, and everybody was like, "No, nope. you're gonna be captain. <laughs> no, <Nope. laughs> you stay." So, and like, anytime something goes wrong, it seems like later on, it's like, uh, "You made me the captain. This is your fault." You know, <laughs> live with the yeah, exactly. You can't bitch about it now. <laughs> Like you all said, the uh, the captain does send a counter offer, which obviously is met with some success. But I think the next thing that really happens is we've got Croker on the wall doing guard duty at the White Tower, which is the home of the syndic and his family and all of his entourage. And that four Velaka comes creeping over the wall. Goodness gracious, that would scare me. I know that. Is he getting a good shot of it, or does he just hear it happen? No, no, no he, he sees it. it. He sees the red eyes and the liquid. The time, liquid. Right? He says it pours itself over the wall. He yeah. saw it come in and go into the tower. And that's when... Then he started hearing the screams. Yeah. No. <sighs> All right. <laughs> so what follows 
is an extraordinary kind of game of cat and mouse between a very well-organized military group in a very confined space trying to track down this were leopard that is running amok in a tower, going from level to level, slaughtering everybody. Everyone. The wizards, they get together, and they all three of them together, they put together a spell that precedes them. Doesn't really clarify what it does, do they? Uh, I, it either protects them or it just, or it's imprint, it pushes. It, it felt like it was like a force blast or something. If you can, A force field. You know, I, I think it, the purpose of, of, of that spell or that group spell was to make sure that the four of Laka did not get past them. Yeah, but they say something about um, speeding up or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. I don't remember. I think they said the four Velaka was just like super fast. Yes. Right. Didn't need silvered weapons to kill it, just needed to be able to hit it, which was the challenge in itself. The Black Company, with pole arms and shields and crossbowmen, tightly organized, going upstairs, rounding corners, going through hallways, sealing the doors mm -hmm. behind them, so that the four Velaka cannot escape. They want to force the damn thing through a particular path. And that's where all these weapons are ready for it. They surprised it with the spell, and then it decided to just jump in among them. Yeah, just jump right in the middle of in the whole company. In a flash, there were six of them dead. Tom Tom was torn apart. They said he had wounds down to the bone in his arms and his chest. Croker said there was, there was nothing the filthy, filthy claws of that creature. Ugh. Clean it as you might, you know, but he knew there was nothing he could do for Tom Tom. Well, all right, so, yeah, he's like, hey, you got to come on over here. <laughs> One eye's like, hey, get over here and look at Tom Tom. His brother. And then he's like, yeah, he's like, oh, man, that gash in his leg, that's going to be dirty. <laughs> and then he sees, and he's like, ripped. <laughs> and somehow he's still alive. Yeah, and the four Velaka just gets away. It just it disengages from them, and in the chaos, they don't know where it went. They well, they had got it down. They, and they were it. sticking it. Yeah, you know, <laughs> um, and with swords and stuff, and then it still got away. Well, got it, up and got away. It, it did, but if you if you remember, they had stuck a uh, a rear guard next to the entrance to make sure it didn't get out and get past them. Mm -hmm. And I think it was the lieutenant. And then lieutenant put a little heat on it and kept it inside the building. I remember that it didn't go out the way that they were expecting it to go out. Yes. And when they finally determined that it wasn't in the building, they realized because of the blood trail that it had gone out one of the windows and down the outside of the tower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it did retreat for sure. But not before it slaughtered almost everybody in the tower. Yeah. Almost everybody so let's get to the point where why was it in the tower well it was well we know why yeah, yeah, yeah. we know why yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we... spoiler we read the book <laughs> so why oh wait we don't want to say that right now that we read the we read the book no that uh what it was doing in the tower well we know why it was there it was there to kill the syndic but because did they, it. they even mention it they even mention it in uh, when they started approaching the bodies in the tower it wasn't exsanguinating them it wasn't pulling out their hearts and livers it was just killing them and moving on so That's it was not to all the other ones it, like, it, in the it, tomb. it wasn't feeding it was not feeding it was killing and it had a single purpose the black company knew its purpose they understood that this was the means by which the black rider had made arrangements to rid them of their contract mm -hmm. as a favor. So that somehow, was it really a favor if they lose almost I all. I don't know. I don't know if it was a favor, if it was a condition of the agreement that they would, you know, whatever. We're not quite there yet. It was mm. somehow this is how it played out based on the knowledge that in order to get out of their contract, the syndicate had to die. The four Velaka ends up trying to do that for them. So you can infer all you want, but it sounds like the Black Rider has a little bit of control over that four Velaka. All right. Which goes right back to paragraph two, sentence one, when that bolt of lightning comes out of the sky, clear blue sky, basically releases the damn thing. So did that bolt of lightning come from the Black Rider? So now the Black Company is searching for their contract holder. They can't find his body anywhere. The syndic's bodyguards were black company members. They're dead. No syndic. Where'd they Chest. find him, Mule? Chest. 
what do they say? It was like 500 pounds or something like that. And it would have been like ornate except of all the blood and gashing and stuff going on around it recently. <laughs> yeah. Before Velaka knew he was in there, it's a strong box made out of stone. Right. 500 pounds or something. And it's destroyed. The orna ornament of it was destroyed by the claws of the four Velaka. So it was unable to get into him, but knew exactly where he was. And then the black company chased him off. And then they found the syndic hiding in that bones. chest. Lying on a pile of money. <laughs> on a <laughs> pile of money, like Scrooge McDuck. Uh. So it's not real clear, as I recall. Yeah. And I read it a couple times, but it's not real clear. But the next thing we know, they find the guy. Mm. They open up the chest. They see him in there. Mm -hmm. Croker turns away for a minute. He mm -hmm. just turns like, whoop. And then the lid is closed, and there's a guy sitting on it, cleaning his fingernails with a dagger. <laughs> mm -hmm. The other guys are, like, looking kind of suspicious or something like that. If mm -hmm. you're cleaning your fingernails with a dagger, yeah, it's pretty suspicious. It was the captain and Elmo, and it was Match who was sitting on top of the crate. Mm. Yeah. And uh, Croker thinks to himself whether or not they would have finished the four Velaka's job and he's all, they wouldn't betray the company's reputation that way, would they? And he's like, no. Maybe. And, then, and then it's important. This is very important right here. He's all, I did not ask. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, this is not a story written by J.R.R. Tolkien. Mm -hmm. they, they murdered their, their contract holder, and he turned a blind eye. All right. So that was the fight of the four Velaka. And I don't, I don't think they stopped there. I think they were like, let's go now. Now is the yeah. time. And they just, they, they packed, they literally packed that night and they're on the road. Yes. In the middle of the night. Oh, yeah. you know, I, I, I remember what one of those negotiations were. They were just talking about if they got out of their contract, what they would do because everybody's so crazy to like kill these guys and stuff. So there's like this peninsula where the ship is going to come and pick them up. And they say, oh, man, we're going to be sitting duck out there. That's Stuff. right. The, the, legget, the legget promised to, uh, once they got out of their contract, to head to this location. Okay. And he would pick them up. Yep. And they said, okay. Thus, implying that he would accept their commission to work for him, to do whatever else. And they were okay with that. But they were very, very nervous because the, that little peninsula was a death trap. They mentioned it was just wormholes of caves, but there was nowhere to go. And all the urban cohorts had to do is just sit out there and wait for them to starve to death. And that's if the legate betray them. Or was even just delayed. Which leads us to one of, I think, the darkest moments of the Black Company, personally. But dark in a good way. Dark in a very good way. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, very, uh, just brutal. Just, just absolutely brutal. Because the Black Company, they don't, just, they don't just pack their stuff and leave town. No, they pack up the wagon train. And they, they send it on down the road, and they're like, we'll catch up to you. Four platoons of these guys, which could amount to about 400 soldiers. We're not real sure. Four platoons of these guys are like, hey, let's go, let's go pay a visit to this urban cohort. It is 3 o'clock in the morning, after all. And they won't see us coming. Three platoons. Okay, so 300 guys, maybe? Because one died. They lost one platoon. They take these three platoons, and they go in, and they see the urban cohort. And the guards are asleep everybody's asleep. The commanders have gotten them back under control after days and days and days of chaos and have convinced them to relinquish all their weapons and return them to the armory because they don't trust them. Smart. So the black company, they split up. They go one barracks after another, killing every single person. 6,000 unarmed sleeping men. <laughs> they just give them that. But if you think oh, they're honorable, right? Well, no, that's, that, was, that was a safety precaution. Was that was tactical. covering their oh, ass. Oh, yeah, that's important. That's it's right. It was not personal, right? It wasn't at all. It was not personal. Well, it it was, probably was a little personal. Maybe a little personal. Actually, it was tactical. because they were. They, he says that uh, it's a little bit of rage for having been here for as long as they had being in right, And mistreated the entire time. They had problems with the urban court the entire time. Mm -hmm. And so there was, there was definitely some people that relished it. So um, this is just to get a little sidetrack. One of the things I really like about this book is like the nicknames they assign their soldiers. You don't know what their real names are. They made up all these names or they were assigned these names like um, Croker. I mean, that's the ship's physician. Talk about a bad, bad luck name. <laughs> and then Mercy, 
Um, uh, who has none? Who obviously. has none? Silent, which is appropriate. Appropriate. But Tom Tom, who had his little drum. One eye. Curly was one eye. Again, a little element of creativity on the part of the author that makes kind of every character a little unique. And also, and, on a side note, this is one of the ways in which Steven Erickson is very obviously a fan of this book. You know, the military guys were all named thusly, Fiddler, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's not, they don't want to have a fighting retreat. That's really what we're getting at. They, so, yeah. they didn't want to be sieged when they were on the peninsula waiting for possibly days for 400 men to be taken out to the boat. You know, a couple of dinghies at a time, six mm -hmm. dinghies, six dinghies, six dinghies. So they killed all of the urban cohort, all of them, and safely retreated to the beach, said goodbye to all the hangers on mm -hmm. and the, what do they call those people? Oh, camp Girl followers. Friends. Camp followers. And they, 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 Girlfriends? They, no, because they're talking, Croker specifically talks about the lady that he's with. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, they, they, he, roots immediately, they so. knew they weren't going to stick around forever, but even still, especially this time, he's kind of choking up, choking up about it. But Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I think well, it was pretty sudden. I mean, they may have known for a week or two, but they didn't really know. When it happened, it was instant. You know, they had to go. Yeah, and I, I think this is actually a, an important part of, like, I guess, again, character development for Croker. He doesn't really emphasize himself, but clearly this was a very important woman in his life at that time. And he never mentioned her before until right then. And he said he got choked up when he said goodbye. Because this is, this is not supposed to be Croker's story. This is the story of the Black Company. That's why he left it out. It's something that happened to all of them, yeah. but that was his yeah. personal experience. He gave her all of the money that he had, too. And, yeah. And then got on that ship. And uh, next thing you know, the soldiers of the Black Rider are in the city taking over. We've got the Black Company on the Black Ship being introduced to this gentleman who One Eye and Tom Tom, they knew who this guy was. His name is Soul Catcher, and we'll get there for in just a minute. But Soul Catcher is going to each and every one of them. And by the time he's finished pinning every single soldier in the Black Company with this little emblem that's on the sail, the skull with the circlet, mm -hmm. he pins every single one of them, and they're on the way. The ship is underway yeah, before yeah. he's done, and it's sun up. Yeah, and they 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 do mention that this little this little I don't know what you would call it. It's an insignia. It's an insignia. But they say it's not, I mean, they say it's valuable. I mean, it's, oh, yeah. it's not just a piece of cloth. I mean, it's yeah. actually a valuable piece of jewelry. Yeah, I think they say something about one eye would, you know. <laughs> yeah, for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but the, the significance of this piece of jewelry only dawns on Croker when he's being pinned. This is the insignia of a famous character known as the Lady. The last two or three paragraphs of this chapter are a very brief history of a period of time called the Domination, where there was a very powerful man called the Dominator, his lady, and ten wizards who opposed them, who were later subdued and taken, of which Soul Catcher is merely mm -hmm. one. Made them slaves. And all ten of them, those ten who opposed the Dominator and his lady, they were all demigods in their own right. But the ten of them were incapable of stopping the Dominator. And that is basically the end of the chapter. That is the mm. introduction to the Black Company. That should give you a flavor mm -hmm. for what is to come. The brutality. Oh, my God. God, it's amazing. I love this book. Like you, no uh, other. I know. Gallows humor, all of it. At the end of the book, also, we find out that in a cage. Oh, right. By the mast is another Forvalaka. Not the same one. Uh, one eye and Croker are by it, kind of like examining it, I guess. And it doesn't have any marks on it whatsoever. I guess they can't tell if one's male or female. <laughs> they could. It was female. Oh, they're both, I, I they're both females. Oh, uh, great. We know how they are. <laughs> female for Balancas, I mean, FFs. <laughs> uh, but this one was unscarred, undamaged, unwounded, not the same one. And there's something cryptic that he says that one eye never figured it out, and he didn't bother to tell him. Which totally contradicts the fact that Mercy was like, hey, you never leave anything out. 
Exactly. And so already there's like you're right. Yeah, no, that's a lie. That's an astute observation. And he's also put himself in the story when he's talking about his lady. And uh yeah, that's interesting. But he did, you know, have to use a sword at one point. So, <laughs> oh, so uh, good. Yeah, yeah. So that's that is a very long winded summary <laughs> of the first chapter. Yeah, you probably could have uh, read the first long chapter long. in the amount of time we took talking about it. But you wouldn't you wouldn't get the panache and the excitement. Yeah, you wouldn't <laughs> understand how excited we are about this novel. Okay, so that's the summary essentially. So now thoughts like i haven't we we three have not sat down and talked about this novel in any length we've individually read it and we've been preparing for this day so now now's our chance to sit down and discuss what we think just happened um for one i want to know about the four Velaka. what what is the significance of there being a second four Velaka on that ship in a cage well, it can't be controlled, so it's still in a cage. Maybe it, it takes control to control it, and you can only do that for so long. So between controlling, you put it in a cage. I don't know. But Maybe dominating. Um, you came up with an interesting theory about how they were able to control that one four Velaka in the city. They may have used this four Velaka as, as leverage. Oh, that, so like they're intelligent. Or something. That, that is the theory that somehow that this this four Velaka mm -hmm. is important to the other four Velaka. Like, maybe there wasn't just one left. Maybe there were two. Maybe it's a mother and a daughter. Maybe a mated pair. Not, well, couldn't be a mated pair. Well, I thought I thought the other one they're was both male. female. Oh, okay. Then I don't know. They're both female. I mean, it's also possible that mm -hmm. they showed up with one just in case the one that was there wasn't enough. What if the black company actually killed it? They could have. So okay, release another one. They obviously released the first one. There's no question in my mind that that was intended and that Soulcatcher did that. Soulcatcher probably even whispered mm -hmm. that there was jewels and wealth and privilege up in the, in the tomb, you know, suckered some dum-dum into going up there and mm -hmm. breaking the final seals. So that, that gets into what, what, what we would sort of talked about earlier is when Leggett went there, how much of a plan did he actually have? What were his intentions? What did he want to accomplish? And how much was just seeing, seeing how it goes and figuring it out? He definitely went there to take over that city. And he did it, from his point of view, bloodlessly. He did. Okay, but his claim all along was that they were simply there, innocently, looking for allies. Because they needed, they needed ships. Naval power. They needed naval power. They're just, we just want to be buddies. You're, mm -hmm. we have strong military might. You have strong naval might. Let's be friends. Mm -hmm. That was why he was there. The syndic wasn't having any of it. He's like, nah, nah, I don't like you. Mm -hmm. You got too much black clothing on. I don't you like know, you. That's exactly what the captain of the black company was like. Hey, you probably should take this deal. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean he was telling him straight away, take this deal or else it's not going to be good. Well, what did he say? He said it was better to be an ally than a, oh, what is it called? When you give, I'm thinking of Civilization the game. <laughs> when you tribute, tribute. He said it was better to be an ally than a tributary. Yeah. Well, that's right, yeah. And that is true because it's either you're dead or you're an ally. It's better to be an ally. But the syndic had heard the rumors. The syndic was aware. One Eye was aware the civilization to the north, this is where Soul Catcher comes from, is the north. Mm -hmm. The civilization to the north, their reputation precedes them. They're brutal. They're horrible. A, a great evil or something like that. They're that is spreading. The syndic was aware mm -hmm. of these rumors, and he didn't want to ally mm -hmm. with something this evil. It was very clear that Soul Catcher had been completely manipulating things from the very beginning. And what I don't understand is... Did he have sights on getting the black company from the beginning? That's a good question. I don't know. Or did he just opportunistically take charge of them and, and commission them? With somebody like this, it could go either way. But, I mean, the black company plays such a pivotal part. And remember, there's something else about Soulcatcher. So when he speaks, he actually speaks in multiple voices, male, female. Young, uh, old. Young, old, all different types. He um, that way, too. What's that? And he looks that way a little also. Uh, he looks more feminine and small. Right. But, uh, the voices are definitely distinct. Yeah. Different people. 
you have somebody of this power and this wisdom and this used to getting his way, I wouldn't rule out that he wanted the city and he wanted the black company and he manipulated all of them to get what he wanted. Yeah, I would say that's that's very reasonable. And he did it bloodlessly. Yep. He didn't and, lift a finger. Well, he didn't lift a finger. <laughs> exactly. He did not lift a finger. He just got other people to fight for them and get, so he gets what he wants. When they're discovering who the legate is, Soul Catcher, mm-hmm. this is on the ship after being pinned and all this other stuff, and they realize what they've done. It's uh, they realize that they're in like a they're they're in a bad situation. Well, then you think signed up with. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's an understatement. Uh, yeah, yeah is, no kidding. Doesn't uh, get any worse than like, this. And as each step that they realize that they're getting deeper and deeper into it, Soulcatcher is just laughing maniacally each time. Mm-hmm. And just kind of goading them along also. They don't come out and say it, but what the reason I think Soulcatcher is laughing is because members of the, the black company realize for the first time that this commission is for the rest of their lives. Yeah, you uh, don't leave. Some of the times when uh, something is being thought by Croker, he gets that answered by Soulcatcher also, if I remember correctly. Reading his mind. There's a few times. Eh, maybe just realizing that you realize. I think, think it happens once. Yeah. And it's once, yeah. Th- he responded to something that Croker had been thinking. Yeah, I don't remember what it was specifically. But you're right. I, I mean, do. I do. It. it was when he was recall. He was like, "Oh shit, this person's this person," and he's right. like, "Huh?" Yeah. The like, captain's like, "Tell me, tell me what's up," and then he tells the story about the dominators and all that. Stuff. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So the question. There's another question that I have. Actually, it's not the question, but um, why didn't one eye say anything? Because the wizards always like to keep secrets. They do like to keep secrets. Then they don't want to let you know. But it got his brother killed, and it got him basically indentured for the rest of his life. Oh, and that's the other thing that's so tragic about this, because his brother is dead. There's a moment where they're getting to the ship, and one eye's like, see you later, guys. I'm done. Yeah, he he tries to bail. I'm going to go back south. Maybe they won't remember me anymore. I That's mean, the best. Hundred. <laughs> That's the best. He's a hundred years old, and he's been on the run from the south for something that he did for who knows how long. He's like, maybe they've forgotten by now. I'm going home. And they're like, so no. Nah. They all are like, no, and they up, you know, one, two, three, throw him over. And there's a moment where Croker's like, it was nice to see one eye showing a little spunk. You know, no, this. Didn't want to go, you know. He wasn't showing spunk. Your old man. (laughs) And they throw him in the boat. (laughs) He's like, my brother's dead. I don't want to be here anymore. You guys can all go uh, have fun. But no, you're in the family. You're in the family is what they say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They built both of those characters, though, as not liking the water, if you recall. Yeah, they did say that. Both the twins didn't like the water. They probably were like, when they were enslaved, they probably. They're going back north. They're crossing an ocean. Yeah. So somewhere where they know because yeah yeah well there's a lot of reasons not to want to go north but uh they're they're all going together one big happy family Mm. I would say the people that got off easiest would be the camp followers because they got the they got the benefit of you know knowing the black company not being killed (laughs) and they got to stay put but oh yeah but there's a plague going on too right now because they talk about that was a minor, they minorly emphasized Malaka being the being the designator of the disease that's going around the city. Well, it's like, I think Soul Catcher was just adding more fuel to the fire. I think he was exploiting the four Velaka attacks to maybe put plague there, or somebody was, to just really stir the pot a little bit more and make it crazy to keep uh, people's attentions elsewhere, to to keep them scrambled and afraid. But uh, regardless of the fact of whether or not there's a plague in the city, this is how that empire spreads. And it, it's here now. As we'll see in chapter two, this is not a normal empire. Mm-hmm. Oh, and what we didn't mention is that these, there was the dominator. Spoilers? No, and the, no, it's not. Okay. And the dominated, which is the, the 10, 10 most powerful wizards, the demigods, taken. the taken. Oh, it's not concurrent in, in that sense. It happened 300 years ago. And I think they implied that they're surprised that they're, they're figuring it out and they're coming. They didn't realize they were still alive. I don't know. They didn't say it's that a, very well. It's a very good last couple of pages. The reveal mm-hmm. is just really good. Somebody like, I think 
it's revealed later on that it's an archaeologist, maybe. Somebody accidentally released them. Oh, that's right. It's, it's in here. They were bound. They were bound by a very powerful mm -hmm. woman at one point. The but dominator. yeah, that's right. Oh. It was an archaeologist. Oh, here we go. We weren't destroyed, just chained and buried alive. His laughter had a hysterical edge. Chained, buried, and eventually liberated by a fool named Bowman's Croker. So that's what happened. They got released. It doesn't. It's not real specific about when, but it was a long time ago. Mm. And it's like it had it had been so long that it had receded into legend. And then this guy Bowman's comes along and releases them yeah. on yeah. accident somehow. And then. There goes that world. Yep. Well, he was he was interested in history and academics, and yeah, he released them on accident. Yep. Good job there, buddy. Good job. So, so what else we got? I don't know. So the lightning bolt was from Soul Catcher. I, I think so. Or one of his intermediaries, something. Yes. In one means or another, he did that on purpose. As of right now, we don't know of anybody else capable of doing that. Soulcatcher is the only wizard we're aware of mm -hmm. on that ship. He's obviously very powerful, and it was a bolt of lightning out of a clear blue sky. Not exactly a natural occurrence. So yeah, I'm I'm pretty much ninety percent. Yeah, it was Soulcatcher did that. Yeah, yeah, he was just again manipulating circumstances to achieve his ends. Yeah, I think so. And such a oh, just a nice plot, you know? Like that's a plot in my opinion without really any holes. And it's not even a novel. That is literally a preface. Okay, so I asked you that before, and I don't. I know you didn't know, but I'll throw it out there for anybody that can answer if they care to. Uh, this has a very nice, tight feeling, like it may have been in like a magazine or something at one time. Was this written with that kind of concept, and that it would just build as chapter? Because I mean. I didn't read everything, everything, everything. So I don't know how it, the future goes in the oh, writing. You mean you, you haven't know. finished this book yet? No, the know, series. I don't, I don't know. Like I would say by this point in his career, he was writing novels. He wasn't writing for magazines that I'm aware of. I know he has two stories published in magazines, but he was not a big journal writer. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing he wrote this to be a novel. All right. That's a guess. I'm just I really don't know. It's, it's a good first chapter. It is a it's, whole, uh, you story. know, <laughs> it is a great short story all in its own. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. I like that aspect of it too. Yeah, no, I do. Too. I wrote down all the names that I think I caught of the characters you were talking about. Did you get Elmo? Yeah. So I've got Croaker, obviously. Obviously. One Eye, just the company characters. Yeah, yeah. There's the lieutenant and the captain, Curly. Pokey, <laughs> All Eye, and Wild Bruce died. They were the poisoned ones. Yeah. Did I say Whitey? Uh, I don't think so. There's Mercy. Mercy died. Well, Mercy we're not 100. percent He said right. he it seemed like Mercy died, but he said okay. Mercy wasn't gonna pull through. He, 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 kept, <laughs> he was asked a few times. Like there was like every time he met with the captain, he's like, "How's Mercy doing?" He's all, "I seem pretty. I mean, he's pretty bad. I think he's gonna die, but." I've seen miracles. And then they asked him again, and it still didn't sound good. Silent, the bee magician. Hornet. Tom Tom, he carried a drum fetish, they called it. He died. Goblin, Candy, Match, and Elmo. Goblin's a wizard, right? Yeah. So there you go. I might have missed a couple. <laughs> they yeah. talked about Goblin being a lawyer in his past life until he moved oh, up to pimping. He moved up to pimping. <laughs> so how dare you call me a lawyer? <laughs> 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 so who's who died so far like who died while we were reading ignoring the poisoned people we lost mercy tom 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 wild bruce no no those are poisoned people not those guys these I guess people I guess died true. in this chapter oh, okay. there were a hundred unnamed people oh uh, well, yeah and, and then maybe then one more because of the mole's there's tavern there's a there's 106 people died no the per least. nobody died in the tavern it's said, feel like guy. It said he was hurt. And and under his shield. Went yeah, down. Right. It said he went down, and then it's. It, and it, then it, Kroger fills the area. You're right. He might not have died. No, but the, after that, after they've calmed everything down, it said Duker. Duker. Uh, oops. oops. <laughs> yeah, you did it. Oops. Yeah, you did it. Don't say anything yet. Don't. <laughs> Kroger tended his wounded that. man. The yeah. wounded man. Yeah, yeah. So they only had one wounded, and he said he tended him, and they left it at that. So we lost a couple. 
diminished, but on a ship heading north. There's also twice that he mentioned uh, vultures evicting eagles from their perch. And eagle. Yeah, and eagle, you're right. Uh, two times, though, but yeah. Which is one of the, like, the very, the very first two pages are filled with omens that they should have recognized as portent. And then hindsight, you know, they realized, oh. Okay. Well, and of course, he kind of demeaned it because, you know, who really you know pays attention to that kind of stuff hindsight's 2020 bro anybody can anybody can do that and be like oh my god this meant that this was gonna happen and, you know. uh in <laughs> fact you know it's funny you say hindsight one uh this i don't know why i wrote it <laughs> uh he had marvelous hindsight yeah, <laughs> yeah they call him one eye yeah one eye one eye's handicap in no way impairs his marvelous hindsight that's right, yeah <laughs> brilliantly said yes and obviously a dig yeah, yeah, <laughs> obviously. Well, I'm looking forward to chapter two. Raven, who is, that's a person's name. Episode two, probably going to be a month before we can do it. That's horrible. The internet doesn't have a schedule. And it's not like we've got people waiting on our bated breath, right? Oh, well, there might be. No, there uh, might be. There's one of you so out please, there. Leave, oh, leave right all now. your comments. I'll be right now. <laughs> Good, bad, ugly. No, no bad, no ugly. We don't <laughs> So and you read the book. Join us. You can listen to it on YouTube. Listen to it on YouTube or wherever the heck we can publish it as a podcast. I mean, and, I mean, uh, the book is on YouTube. The book itself is? Yeah. Now read the damn book. Read it. Yes, it's read, read it. Read Buy a book. copy because it's still in print, thank God. Buy a copy, read it, you know, and then come talk to us about what you thought of it. All right. Moving forward. As in, no, we're done. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, you want to let people know where you, they can reach you? Nah, we'll put that stuff in the description. Yeah. Well, if people actually care about our commentary, we'll actually, I'll probably actually start reading, reading more. And uh, which is to say that he didn't read the, the chapter. <laughs> I did read the chapter. No, no, he didn't. Well, since the record, yeah. Yeah. This is the second time, the second book I've ever read twice. Um, and I tell you what, I'm glad I did because uh, it's so much more insightful. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So much more insightful. A book this complex, you have to read it twice. Worth it. Yep. Definitely worth it. All right, thanks, guys, for hanging out. 